Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Orthopedic Surgery Podcast, a curated series of interviews and discussions highlighting the three shields of orthopedic surgery at Mayo Clinic, clinical practice, research, and education. Welcome back to the Mayo Clinic Orthopedic Surgery Podcast. I'm really excited today to welcome Kalechi Okoraha. He's an outstanding sports medicine surgeon who joins us. He did uh, undergrad at Xavier and played basketball there, did med school at Howard University, and then did his um, residency training at Henry Ford. He's a fellowship trained sports surgeon. He trained at Rush University, helps take care of the Minnesota Timberwolves with our sports medicine group. And we're really excited to have him join us today to tell us a little bit more about hip impingement. Thanks for joining, Casey. Uh, Thanks for having me on, Jeff. This is a topic that seems to just be continually changing. And I think it was really kind of new when I was a resident. We started to talk about hip impingement. Maybe it was just new to me, but the field seems to continually slowly change. Can you talk to us about what the current thinking is about hip impingement? Is it congenital? Is it developmental? Where, where does it come from and how does it fit into the uh, to hip pain in young athletes? Yeah, well, I think the understanding of hip impingement has uh, expanded quite a bit, you know, over the last 10 years. I mean, I think we know that hip impingement is defined as a normal contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum, and that continues to be diagnosed at increasing rates. So I think as we learn more about hip impingement, our treatment algorithms continue to evolve. So we first started with performing hip arthroscopies with labral debridements, you know, then after we understand the importance of, you know, correcting the bony abnormalities and preserving the labrum, surgeons started performing osseous corrections, you know, and then they started performing labral repairs, you know, and now we're finding that, you know, whereas initially capsule closure was thought to be not so important, I think the current literature really demonstrates that patients that undergo hip arthroscopy without capsule closure uh, have decreased outcomes. So I think it's important to, you know, perform capsule closure. So I think currently we've evolved into the surgical treatment and performing a comprehensive management of all the structures. And that includes a labral repair, femoral neck osteochondroplasty, acetabuloplasty, and then capsule closure whenever possible. That's great. And it sounds like it's really uh, uh, adapted a lot since I was really learning about it a lot. Is it thought that this is congenital or is it thought it's uh, developmental or some combination of the two? How, how are we, um, how is the, how are these bumps and, and uh, things forming? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, I like to put the hips at risk of impingement into three categories. So you can have abnormal anatomy, and normal use, that speaks to what you were talking about, that can be either congenital, you know, such as a skiffy, that could be hip dysplasia, or even prior surgery. Then you can have normal anatomy and abnormal use, where that use really exceeds the tolerance of the joint structures. Now that can be an acute injury in like a contact athlete, or that can be a chronic injury, you know, involving either occupational or recreational use. And then that last category is a combination of abnormal anatomy and abnormal use, which is really common as well. Got it. And, and is the thought that um, once, once these changes develop, or once you really start to use it in this way, that this is actually rapidly or is moving you toward arthritis or is treatment geared at just symptomatic management? Yeah. So I, I think we do believe that hip impingement can lead to early arthritis. Um, in fact, if you look at the studies, um, studies have shown that up to 70 to 90% of all hip arthritis is caused by either FIA or hip dysplasia. Got it. So it, it seems to be a, a, a growing number. And, and the, I think the harder part that I also see is I see a lot of, let's say, middle-aged or slightly older uh, patients with hip pain. How do you sort of go about the workup and, and thinking about if, if they're a candidate for hip preservation or um, if they need to go down a different road, let's say toward total hip replacement? Yeah, so I think that's the, the, the middle-aged population is the most difficult population. I think the young patients are pretty, you know, set forward. They have a label tear. They have a huge cam. I think those middle-aged patients are similar to the degenerative meniscus tear. So if you image everybody over 40, 
and get a hip MRI, you're going to find labral tears, you're going to find cam deformities. The question is, who needs treatment? All right, so I think in those set of patients, it's important to exhaust your non-operative management with physical therapy, you know, your injections, um, and see who really needs surgery. Now, we've done some studies to really evaluate what patient factors lead to um, increased success after hip arthroscopy. And some of those are lower BMI, younger age, especially under 45, decreased arthritis, and really getting to that treatment within six months. Those are the uh, factors found to be most beneficial. Got it. That sounds great. So let's look at the younger uh, population then, let's say. A more straightforward situation, maybe abnormal anatomy, maybe I would guess maybe the abnormal anatomy and abnormal use patients fall out a little bit earlier in, in, in this category. But uh, do you go th- through the process of physical therapy and go through the process of an MRI or is, uh, or sorry, of an injection? Or is this a situation where you say the anatomy is uh, problematic enough that we're going to, we're going to jump straight to surgery? How do you make that decision? Yeah, that's a very great question because I actually treat patients differently by their age groups. So my younger patients are, I still do a trial of physical therapy. I still get advanced imaging with MRI just to see what's going on. But in the younger pages, when it's really, you know, telltale, I don't inject them just because I'm worried about, you know, steroid in the joint and then their cartilage being preserved. So in those patients, after they fail physical therapy and they have a uh, labral tear and a huge cam, I'll go straight to surgery. That makes sense. And, and for the older patients, even with um, very early arthritis, are the patients that um, seem to fall into, let's say, lower BMI and a better candidate for hip arthroscopy, even in the middle age, is there a role for hip arthroscopy or is it just kind of wait for a total hip replacement? How do you, how do you decide to finally indicate somebody for that? Yeah, there's, there's definitely a role. Like you said, in those ideal patients where they have a low BMI, uh, they're, you know, middle age, but not too old and they don't have a lot of arthritis. What I'll do is I'll do an injection. Okay. Like you said before, and that injection does two things. It's diagnostic and it's therapeutic. So if I perform an injection in the hip and that patient gets pain relief, I know def- definitively then that pain is coming from the hip. Okay. It's not coming from the back, you know, the muscles it's coming from inside the joint. And then number two, it gives them some therapeutic, uh, effect. So it gives them some pain relief, allows them to really do physical therapy and see if this is something we treat non-operatively. In those patients, if they fail that, that's when I indicate them for a hip arthroscopy. Got it. That makes sense. And, and thoughts about time frame after injection to surgical management? Do you have a cutoff that you like to go by? Yeah, usually three months. And I think the hip uh, and knee literature is similar. Yeah, the, the shoulder literature has gone that way, even for shoulder arthroscopy, which is pretty low risk operation, just like hip arthroscopy. But it's it's interesting because I see a lot of patients who have almost a reflex injection into into something, let's say, and probably it's more common in your young patients where they go in and somebody's given them an injection and now you've really uh, lost three months of right. prevention time. But in the older patient, obviously, a little uh, less critical, especially in terms of that decision making, that makes sense. Right. I mean, that is a hard number, but I'm less worried about infection and arthroscopy. So, you know, it's not a hard number. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the the steps of the procedure? So I know that, uh, or my understanding is that there's uh, portions of the procedure that you do on the acetabular side, portions on the femoral side. Do you do all of the procedures? And then you talked a little bit about labral repair versus debridement, capsular closure. Do you do all the procedures on every patient or... Um, or as by and large, or, or is it really individualized based on what their deformity looks like and, and, um, and how they got the tear? Yeah. So I, I really try to treat patients in an a la carte manner based on the pathology present, you know, so if there's a label repair, I try to preserve labeled tissue. So I'm trying to do a label repair whenever possible. And then you start looking at the femoral cam or the pencil deformity. Now, most patients have a combination of both, but I only treat what I see. You know, so if they have a cam deformity, I'm going to do osteochondroplasty and get that alpha angle uh, under 55. You know, if they have a a large center edge angle and they have a large pencil deformity, then I'm doing acetabuloplasty. And then all my patients get a capsule closure. That's great. And is the, is that an intraoperative decision, most of those steps, or is it more based on the radio, radio, radiographs and the MRI scan about the, the femoral side and the acetabular side? 
I think for the most part, you can see that on, on an MRI. Uh, I do get CT scans on some of my patients, especially patients that I'm concerned with some version issues of the, either the femur or the acetabulum. So that really allows you to assess that bony abnormality. Perfect. And um, one of the things I sometimes read about is the thought of labral reconstruction as opposed to labral repair. Thoughts about that in, in uh, current age? Yeah, so labor uh, reconstruction is a great tool to have. Those are going to be the patients where they have a real diminutive labrum or they've had previous procedures and don't have a lot of labrum. So the labor reconstruction is a procedure we can do where we take either an autograft or an allograft tissue and really form a new labrum for that patient. Now, I think this, you know, kind of kicked off, you know, t- five to 10 years ago. Um, but we've done some recent research in, at Rush and um, evaluating augmentation versus reconstruction. So augmentation is a little bit different in that you don't take down the whole labrum and put in new tissue. You really just augment your new labrum on top of that old tissue. And what we think is because the labrum provides a suction seal effect to the hip. So think about if you have a suction cup on something. If you do a 360 degree resection and then fix it down by eight points, you still have some space in between those you know, repairs to, for space air. Whereas if you augment, you're putting new tissue on top of that and you really don't lose as much of that suction seal. So I'm more of a fan of augmentation whenever I can than reconstruction. That makes a lot of sense. And, and um, going the opposite direction, do you think there's a role for debridements in any patients or is that something that sort of has gone by the wayside uh, for the most part? Yeah, I think the debridements are going to be more in your older you know, patients that have a degenerative labral tear. There's not really much tissue to repair. Those are still good candidates for, you know, debridement, but most and large, we try to repair it whenever we can. Great. And uh, I, my understanding is that the learning curve for hip arthroscopy is, is fairly steep. And obviously the costs are high if you don't get it quite right in terms of either cartilage uh, defects or heaven forbid femoral neck fractures or otherwise. Can you talk about some of the key components and maybe talk a little bit about the learning curve about um, sort of frequency of use or somebody um, thoughts about low volume hip arthroscopy surgeons? Yeah. So hip arthroscopy is not as common as shoulder knee arth- arthroscopy. And so it requires some, you know, additional expertise or training, you know? So one thing that's not as common is use a 70 degree scope, you know? So that is a little bit difficult, especially for residents and fellows. And therefore they don't get as much practice and training, you know? So a key to a really successful hip arthroscopy is performing the procedure in an atraumatic nature. So you're not damaging any cartilage or any labrum on the way in. And so it's harder to teach that because coming in the you know, hip is not, is not easy. And so as a resident or a fellow, if you're doing that and you're damaging cartilage or the labrum, you're already sending yourself back. You know? So I just think it's something that needs a little bit more practice and detail in the lab and a little more uh, familiarity with that 70 degree scope. Got it. And it sure um, sounds, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it sure sounds like with the, the indications, the way that they are, it's, it's, um, uh, there's a challenges within the, it's a, it's a sort of a complex indications game, but then also a complex surgical game. And probably uh, seems like something best done by people who are doing a relatively high volume. Yeah, I'd agree. It's uh, best done by people that are doing a high degree of volume. I think when we look at what's the most common uh, reason for reoperation, it's inadequate quit bony re- resection, you know? So I think, you know, you have to have experience in really resecting that cam to the proper level. And then the second reason is probably capsular closure. Um, so we know that the iliofemoral ligament is the strongest ligament in the body. It's a key hip stabilizer. And so back in the day, nobody used to repair the capsule a lot of the times just because it's too difficult to do. You know, you're end of the procedure, you're two hours, 30 minutes, three hours. Some people just, you know, bailed. What we're finding is that those patients that didn't have capsule closure are doing worse than patients that do. So uh, capsule closure is a key component as well. That's interesting. And, and can you talk about sort of the technique around that capsular closure and then tie into that? Any emerging technologies that you see over the next few months or years that will come out that you think will dramatically change this game again? Yeah, so just a little bit about the capsule closure. Uh, it depends on what you do. So some people just make a straight incision in the capsule and some people perform a T in the capsule. 
But what you really want to do is make sure that you have a suture knot every one to two centimeters of capsule closure you do to make sure you have a tight repair. Um, so that's about capsule closure. And then emergent techniques. Um, there's a lot of current technologies that are current coming out. Um, there's one that's used to map the bony deformities preoperatively, and then you can correlate that intraoperatively to kind of check your resection. Um, so these are techniques that are useful to really check your bony uh, resection, and they're really useful in you know surgeons that haven't done a lot of hip arthroscopies. That's super helpful. I'm going to try and uh, summarize what this shoulder surgeon learned about hip arthroscopy, and then uh, you can update uh, what I got wrong and have any uh, final comments for our listeners who. I'm sure excited about continuing to move this uh, ball forward. So it sounds like obviously hip arthroscopy is, is here to stay and the early concerns about not exactly finding out who should have it or when should have it are uh, dying down as the indications really tighten down. It sounds like there's sort of a combination of some congenital factors um, or uh, abnormal growth patterns, but then there's clearly uh, some use uh, issues in association with this and and that combination or overplay seems to be really important in terms of making decisions. Sounds like we've gotten confident enough about the procedure that in young athletes with um, pretty clear anatomic deformities, going straight to surgery is a reasonable option as opposed to uh, nursing things along with injections, which potentially could have some risk of complications. But in the older population, um, it's uh, where there's a few more pain generators that could be uh, in play an injection for diagnostic and therapeutic reasons can be really helpful. And then finally, the tech, it's a very technical uh, operation, it sounds like, with a number of different steps that, that really need to be done to give the patient a best chance uh, at a good outcome, uh, particularly addressing the bony abnormality sufficient, sufficiently, uh, repairing or reconstructing the acetabular labrum, and then obviously capsular closure, which you mentioned a few times. Any other thoughts that you'd like to add for people who are either interested in hip impingement or uh, surgeons who want to maybe add it to their, to their game or residents who are interested in it? Yeah, no, that, that's a really great summary of hip impingement and where we are. I would just say, you know, if you want to do hip arthroscopy, make sure you go somewhere, either a fellowship that has somebody doing it in high volume or make sure you get a lot of practice. But I don't think, you know, people should give up. I think if you want to do it, you know, there's plenty of opportunities um, to get it done right. Beautiful. Thanks so much for joining us. All right. Thanks for having me.